to obtain complete DNA profiles for each of those individuals? Yes, I was, and I was able to use them as their standards. Did you receive a sexual assault kit from Mary Rice? Yes, I did. Okay. And did it include um, outer vaginal swabs and cervical swabs? Yes. And what were you able to determine from those swabs? For the outer vaginal swab, the process that I talked about before, about taking the extraction or performing the extraction and then running it to see how much DNA is there, at that step for the outer vaginal swabs, the DNA estimate that came back was uh, insufficient male detected, meaning a very, very low amount of male is detected, but not enough where I would expect any kind of results if I ran it through the entire process. So analysis was stopped at that point on the outer vaginal swabs. In terms of the cervical swabs, went through extraction, then quantitation, then at that quantitation step, no male DNA was detected, so analysis was stopped at that step. Okay. Did the um, kit also include rectal swabs? Yes, it did. And what were you able to determine from those swabs? For the rectal swabs, it, when I looked, it ran through the entire process, and when I looked at the DNA profile, it was a mixture that was consistent with two people. So then I compared Mary Rice's DNA to this mixture, and determined that she's an expected donor because I could see her DNA within this mixture. My next step was then to compare William Boyette Jr.'s DNA to the mixture from the rectal swabs, and I concluded that he is included as the, in the mixture as a possible contributor. So whenever I include someone into a mixture, I have to report a statistic, and the statistic is that the observed mixture on the rectal swabs is greater than 700 billion times more likely to occur if the sample originated from Mary Rice and William Boyette Jr. than from Mary Rice and an unknown, unrelated individual. Okay. Um, just because there's foreign DNA on an anal swab, can you confirm or deny whether there was a sexual assault? No, I cannot tell you if it's from a consensual act or if it's from rape. I can only tell you the DNA that is found on an item. Okay. Did you also receive a buckle swab from Kayla Crocker? Yes, I did. Did you receive a buckle swab from Loretta Crocker? Yes. Okay. And were you able to obtain complete DNA profiles for each of those individuals? Yes, I did. Okay. Did you receive some shoelace pieces? Yes. Okay. And um, did you swab each of the pieces of the shoelaces? Yes, there were four uh, pieces, shoelace pieces, and each one of those I tested them for possible blood, and they all gave chemical indications for the presence of blood. Then I labeled those shoelace, shoelace pieces A through D, A, B, C, and D, and swabbed each one of those individually. Okay. And what was your finding for each of those? Um, each of those pieces? For shoelace piece D, when I looked at the DNA profile at the end, it looked like a mixture. I could assume that Kayla Crocker is a donor on the shoelace piece A, and then I looked to see what was left over DNA-wise, and what was left over is, is termed the foreign, and the foreign, there was very little information, and because of that, I cannot compare anyone to that foreign, so it's deemed not interpretable. The same thing was with shoelace piece B. It was a mixture, assuming Kayla Crocker is a donor. There is foreign DNA information there, but too limited to use it, so it's not interpretable. Sh uh, shoelace piece C, again, mixture, assuming Kayla Crocker is a donor. There's foreign <coughs> DNA there, but too limited in nature to compare to anyone, so not interpretable. In, term of, in terms of shoelace piece D, at the end, it looked like a mixture of two people. Again, I assumed Kayla Crocker was a donor, but uh, this time I could tell that there was a single source, one person, out, one person left in that profile, and that's termed a partial foreign DNA profile. So because I had that, then I was able to compare uh, William Boyette Jr. to the foreign from the swabbing of the shoelace and concluded that he matches and because I did a match, I report a statistic. 
So this statistic is a frequency of occurrence statistic that shows if, how common or uncommon a DNA profile is in the general population. So for the match of William Boyette Jr. to the swabbing of the shoelace D, the frequency of occurrence of the foreign DNA profile for unrelated individuals is rarer than one in 700 billion. Did you receive um, a swab from interior door two? Yes, I did. Okay, and what was your finding there? My finding was that it was a mixture of at least two people. And sometimes with a mixture, I can see if there's one person who's contributing more DNA than another, and that terms a major. And in this case, I was able to determine that, determine that, that there was a major DNA profile, a major contributor to the interior door too. And when I looked at Kayla Crocker's DNA profile, it matches. So because I reported that as a match, I report a statistic and the frequency of occurrence of the major DNA profile for unrelated individuals is rarer than one in 700 billion. Now, if you talk in terms of major, then, then there needs to be minors. That's pe a person or people that's contributing less to the DNA profile. And in terms of the minors on the interior door, it was limited, non-interpretable. There was some information there, but nothing I could use to compare anyone to. And does it, I mean, would it surprise you that that was Kayla Crocker's home if her DNA was on the uh, interior door? No, it would not. Okay. Um, did you s receive swabs from exterior door one, exterior door two, and interior door three? Yes, I did. Okay, and what was your finding there? All those swabbings had some DNA information in it, but it was limited, can't compare anybody, it's not interpretable. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Will you state your name, please? My name is Shannon Elliott. And Ms. Elliott, where are you employed? I work for the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, known as FDLE. Okay. How long have you worked for FDLE? I've worked for FDLE for over 10 years. What are your specific duties there? I am a DNA crime laboratory analyst. My job is to examine items of evidence in criminal investigations for the presence of bodily fluids, such as blood, semen, and saliva. I also attempt to swab items of evidence for handler. Then I attempt to develop DNA information. And if it is usable, I can then compare it to DNA of people involved in the case. I will write a report as to my findings and come to court to be the voice of the DNA data. Can you um, scoot that microphone in front of you a little bit closer? Sure, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, can you tell the jurors your educational background, please? I have a Bachelor's of Science in Biology with a minor in Mathematics, a Master's of Science in Teaching Post-Secondary, and a Doctorate of Biology Education. Have you received any specialized education or training in the field of forensic DNA analysis? Yes, I completed an over a year long training program with FDLE. Okay, do you have specialized training in the use of statistics to interpret the significance of a DNA test result? Yes, I do. What is that? That training encompassed doing readings, running practice samples, and taking written exams. Okay, and before you actually um, do DNA analysis on casework samples, um, are you required to complete the training? Yes, I am. Do you perform proficiency testing as well? Yes, I do. Okay, can you explain that for the juror? A proficiency test is a mock case that I, will, that I will work like a normal case. It's provided by an external agency, in my case, uh, CTS, Collaborative Testing Services. I will work it like I normally will, and then my supervisor will notify me of my results. I take uh, two proficiency tests per year, and I've never failed a proficiency test. Have you personally performed the procedures involved in forensic DNA analysis? Yes, I have. Approximately how many samples have you worked? I've worked over 6,000 samples. Okay. And is it part of your job to compute statistics? Yes, it is. Okay. When do you compute statistics? I compute statistics whenever there's what's called a match or an inclusion. A match means I look at the DNA profile and can tell that it's just from one person. 
and then if I compare it to the DNA of someone, if there's consistency between those, I will, will say that is a match. And inclusion means when I look at the DNA profile, there's at least two people in that profile. And it, uh, there again, if I compare someone else and I can see that there's overlap, I will, will report it as an inclusion. What type of um, statistics did you generate for this case? I did two different types of statistics. The first one's called a frequency of occurrence and that says how common or uncommon a DNA profile is in the general population. And then I also reported what's called a likelihood ratio. That is a way to compare do two different scenarios. A simple example is that given the evidence, I'm going to compare that the person of interest is the source of that DNA versus a unknown, unrelated person is a source of that DNA. Does computing um, both of those statistics require use of a database? Yes, it does. What is that? The database that I use is a validated database form that NIST, which stands for National Institute of Standards and Technology. Are you familiar with that database? Yes, I am. How was it formed? It was formed by over a thousand samples, blood samples and buckle swab samples from 